Hey Linux enthusiasts, welcome back to another weekly Linux Roundup. I'm Ton, and this week has been absolutely insane for Linux news. We're talking major kernel releases, desktop environment battles heating up, and some distribution releases that are going to change how you think about Linux in 2025. From Linux 6.15's surprise power regression drama to KDE Plasma 6.4's game-changing features entering beta, plus some serious security fixes that you need to know about, we've got it all covered. So grab your favorite beverage, settle in, and let's dive into what's been happening in the Linux world this week. Let's start with the big news that the entire Linux community was talking about this week. Linux 6.15 officially went stable on May 25th, but it came with a nasty surprise that nobody saw coming. Linux 6.15, codenamed after the city where the kernel summit was held, brought some incredible features. We're talking continued Rust integration that's making the kernel more memory safe. Bcache FS stabilization that's finally making this next generation file system production ready and a whole host of hardware support improvements. But here's where things got interesting. And by interesting, I mean potentially laptop killing. The 6.15 release shipped with what the developers are calling a nasty CPU power regression that affected certain systems. We're talking about systems that suddenly started running hotter, draining batteries faster, and in some cases, thermal throttling under normal workloads. The good news? The Linux kernel team caught this quickly. The fix is already merged into the 6.16 development branch and will be backported to 6.15 point releases very soon. But this highlights something crucial about kernel development. Even with extensive testing, edge cases can slip through that affect real-world usage. Speaking of 6.16, the merge window opened this week, and the features coming are absolutely mind-blowing. First up, we have a significant change that's going to affect how you compile your kernels. Linux 6.16 now enforces a minimum compiler version of GCC8 across all architectures, not just x86. This might seem like a small change, but it allows the kernel developers to remove tons of legacy workarounds and use more modern compiler features. But the real excitement is in the new features. We're getting core dump socket support, which means instead of dumping crash information to files, the kernel can now send it over AF Unix sockets. This opens up incredible possibilities for real-time debugging and crash analysis tools. There's also a new x86 native CPU configuration option that automatically optimizes your kernel build for your specific CPU architecture using the dash marc to k native compiler flag. This could give you measurable performance improvements if you're building your own kernels. The graphics driver updates in 6.16 are particularly exciting. We're getting preliminary support for NVIDIA's Blackwell and Hopper architectures with the open source Nouveau driver. While this isn't going to replace the proprietary NVIDIA driver for gaming anytime soon, it's a huge step forward for open source graphics on high-end NVIDIA hardware. AMD users aren't left out either. There are significant improvements to the AMD GPU driver, including better support for the latest RDNA 4 architecture and improved power management across the board. This week also brought some critical security fixes. There was a particularly nasty TLB flush bug that could cause the kernel to inadvertently skip important memory management operations. This has been fixed and is being backported to stable kernel series. We also saw some interesting drama around Git activity that initially raised concerns about possible malicious kernel contributions. Turns out it was just scripting issues, but it highlights how seriously the kernel community takes security and code integrity. Let's shift beers and talk about the distribution landscape. Now let's talk about the distribution landscape because this week brought some major releases and some surprising announcements that are going to reshape how we think about Linux distributions in 2025. Linux 10.0, Enterprise Linux gets a boost. The biggest enterprise news this week was the release of Linux 10.0. For those who might not be familiar, Linux is one of the leading RHEL compatible distributions that emerged after the CentOS drama. 
but Alma Linux 10.0 isn't just following Red Hat's lead. They're actually improving on it in some significant ways. The standout feature is that Alma Linux 10.0 enables frame pointers by default across the entire system. This might sound technical, but it's huge for developers and system administrators. Frame pointers enable real-time system-wide profiling and debugging, which means you can diagnose performance issues and optimize applications much more effectively. But here's where Alma Linux is really differentiating itself from Red Hat. While RHEL 10 only supports x86-64, v3, and higher CPU architectures, effectively abandoning older but perfectly functional hardware. Alma Linux 10.0 provides both x86-64 v3 optimized binaries and x86-64 v2 support. This means if you have older hardware that Red Hat is leaving behind, Alma Linux will continue supporting it with security updates for another 10 years. The Arch Linux ecosystem saw some interesting developments this week. AxOS 25.06 was released, bringing a fresh take on Arch-based distributions with the Hyperland desktop environment as the default. What's particularly interesting about AxOS is their focus on providing a smooth, out-of-the-box Arch experience without sacrificing the flexibility that Arch users love. The AxOS team has also introduced new installation kits that make it easier for newcomers to get started with Arch-based systems while still providing the customization options that power users expect. It's part of a broader trend we're seeing, where Arch derivatives are becoming more user-friendly without losing their technical edge. Alpine Linux 3.22 dropped this week with some significant updates. For those unfamiliar, Alpine is the distribution that powers countless Docker containers due to its incredibly small footprint and security-focused design. The 3.22 release brings updated packages across the board and some important boot process improvements. What's particularly noteworthy is Alpine's continued focus on muscle libc instead of glibc, which contributes to its small size and security benefits. The 3.22.0 release includes updates to critical packages like LLVM 20, Dovecot 2.4, Nginx 1.28, and Node.js with LTS support. Ubuntu made some interesting announcements this week regarding their development process. They're experimenting with monthly development snapshots for Ubuntu 25.10, which could give users and developers much more frequent access to the latest features and improvements. But the bigger news in the Ubuntu ecosystem is actually about Fedora. Fedora Linux is now an officially supported Windows subsystem for Linux distribution. This is huge for developers who work in mixed Windows Linux environments as Fedora brings its cutting edge package versions and rapid release cycle to the WSL ecosystem. Privacy and security, Tails 6.16. The privacy focused community got some good news with the release of Tails 6.16. Tails, the Amesic Incognito Live System, updated its underlying kernel to 6.1.135 and included various security improvements and bug fixes. While Tails might not be daily driver material for most users, it remains the gold standard for privacy-focused computing. Speaking of desktop environments, let's talk about what might be the most exciting part of this week's news. Desktop Environment Wars GNOME versus KDE. Now let's talk about what might be the most exciting part of this week's news, the desktop environment updates that are reshaping the Linux desktop experience in 2025. GNOME 48.2 landed on May 29th as the second maintenance update to the GNOME 48 Bengaluru series. And while it might be a point release, it brings some genuinely useful improvements that show the GNOME team's attention to detail. The release includes two new wallpapers celebrating Pride Month which might seem like a small addition, but it demonstrates GNOME's commitment to inclusivity and community representation. More practically, GNOME 48.2 adds support for restoring tiled and maximized windows to the correct monitor in multi-monitor setups, a feature that anyone with a multi-monitor workflow will immediately appreciate. The settings application received some significant improvements, particularly for users with NVIDIA graphics cards. The About panel now properly displays multiple GPU names on desktop systems with multiple graphics cards, fixing a long-standing annoyance for users with hybrid graphics setups. 
password generation also got smarter with improved logic that uses EFF's word lists for random passphrases. This means the passwords GNOME generates are not only more secure, but also easier to remember when you need to type them manually. What's particularly interesting about GNOME 48.2 is how it addresses some of the persistent pain points that users have been reporting. The Nautilus file manager now loads directories before thumbnail attributes are ready, which means faster browsing in folders with lots of images or videos. The Epiphany web browser fixed two crashes that were affecting incognito mode and file downloads. These might seem like small fixes, but they represent GNOME's maturation as a desktop environment. The team is clearly listening to user feedback and prioritizing stability and usability improvements alongside their larger design vision. KDE Plasma 6.4 Beta, the future of customization. But if Genome 48.2 is about polish and refinement, KDE Plasma 6.4 Beta is about pushing boundaries and introducing features that could fundamentally change how we interact with our desktops. The beta was released on May 22nd, with the stable release expected on June 17th. The headline feature is the major UI revamp for the spectacle screenshot utility. Screenshots are something every Linux user deals with regularly, and KDE's new approach promises to make the process much more intuitive and powerful. But that's just the beginning. One of the most exciting features in Plasma 6.4 is support for per virtual desktop custom tile layouts. This means you can have completely different window tiling configurations on different virtual desktops. Imagine having a coding layout on one desktop, a media consumption layout on another, and a communication layout on a third, all automatically applied when you switch between them. This level of customization has been a dream for power users, and KDE is making it a reality, combined with the improved KWIN X11 window manager and the new Aurori theme engine for window decorations, Plasma 6.4 is shaping up to be the most customizable desktop environment ever created. KDE Plasma 6.4 also introduces a new HDR calibration wizard, which is huge for users with HDR-capable monitors. HDR support on Linux has been a long-standing challenge, and KDE is taking the lead in making it accessible to regular users, not just those willing to dive into complex configuration files. The window management improvements are equally impressive. You'll be able to control whether a window has a title bar and frame directly from the Task Manager context menu, and you can fully disable system tray icons from applications that don't provide their own settings for this. KRunner, KDE's application launcher and search tool, is getting improved search result ordering and support for various types of color codes. This might seem minor, but KRunner is central to the KDE workflow, and these improvements will be felt by users dozens of times per day. The notification system is also getting an upgrade with support for sending persistent notifications to the notification history and the ability to start system updates directly from notifications. These quality of life improvements show that KDE is thinking holistically about the user experience, not just adding flashy new features. What's fascinating about watching GNOME and KDE evolve is how they're taking different approaches to similar challenges. GNOME continues to focus on simplicity and opinionated design choices that work well for most users, while KDE embraces complexity and customization for users who want complete control over their environment. Both approaches are valid, and both are producing excellent results. The competition between these desktop environments is driving innovation that benefits all Linux users, regardless of which desktop they prefer. Let's shift gears and talk about hardware support, because this week brought some significant developments that are going to improve the Linux experience on both cutting edge and legacy hardware. The biggest hardware news this week is the preliminary support for NVIDIA Blackwell and Hopper architectures in the mainline kernel. While we're still not at the point where you can game on high-end NVIDIA cards with open source drivers, this represents a massive step forward for open source graphics on Linux. What makes this particularly exciting is that it's happening in the mainline kernel, not in some experimental branch. 
This means that distributions will be able to ship this support out of the box and users won't need to jump through hoops to get basic functionality on newer NVIDIA hardware. The Nuvo driver improvements also include better power management and thermal control, which has been a persistent issue with open source NVIDIA drivers. While we're not quite ready to recommend ditching the proprietary driver for gaming, these improvements make the open source option much more viable for general computing tasks. AMD users are getting some love too, with improved AMD GPU driver support for the latest RDNA 4 architecture. AMD has generally been much better about open source driver support, and these improvements continue that trend. The RDNA 4 improvements include better power management, improved performance scaling, and enhanced support for modern display technologies. AMD's commitment to open source drivers continues to pay dividends for Linux users who want high performance graphics without proprietary driver headaches. Intel made some interesting moves this week with the merger of an overclocking watchdog driver for Linux 6.16. This might seem niche, but it represents Intel's continued investment in Linux support for enthusiasts and enterprise features. Intel's graphics drivers also received updates for the Z architecture, including fan speed control and improved power management. While Intel's discrete graphics cards are still finding their footing in the market, the Linux support has been excellent from day one. The ARM ecosystem saw continued improvements with better support for Snapdragon X Elite processors. These ARM-based laptop processors are becoming increasingly important as more manufacturers explore alternatives to traditional x86 laptops. The improvements include better power management, improved peripheral support, and enhanced compatibility with existing Linux software. While ARM laptops are still a niche market, the foundation being laid now will be crucial as ARM becomes more mainstream in the laptop space. One of the most important hardware-related stories this week is Alma Linux's decision to continue supporting x86-64 v2 architectures even as Red Hat moves to require x86-64 v3. This might seem technical, but it has real-world implications for users with older hardware. x86-64 v2 includes processors from around 2009 and later, while x86-64 v3 requires features that weren't common until around 2015. By supporting both, Alma Linux is ensuring that perfectly functional older hardware can continue running modern Linux distributions with full security support. In the emerging AI hardware space, the open source Rockchip NPU driver project continues making progress. While not yet mainlined, this driver could eventually provide open source AI acceleration for ARM-based systems. This is particularly important as AI workloads become more common in everyday computing. Having open source drivers for AI acceleration hardware ensures that Linux users won't be locked out of the AI revolution by proprietary software requirements. What a week it's been in the Linux world! We've covered everything from Linux 16.15's power regression drama to KDE Plasma 6.4's revolutionary customization features. From Alma Linux 10.0's enterprise innovations to the ongoing desktop environment evolution. The big themes this week have been maturation and innovation happening simultaneously. We're seeing established projects like GNOME focusing on polish and stability, while projects like KDE push the boundaries of what's possible on the Linux desktop. The kernel continues to evolve with better hardware support and security improvements, while distributions are finding new ways to serve their communities. What excites me most is how the Linux ecosystem continues to grow and evolve. Whether you're a developer working on cutting-edge AI applications, a gamer enjoying the latest titles through Proton, or an enterprise administrator managing critical infrastructure, Linux has something for you in 2025. If you enjoyed this weekly roundup, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any Linux news. Let me know in the comments which story from this week excited you the most. Was it the KDE Plasma 6.4 features? the kernel developments, or maybe one of the distribution releases. And don't forget to check out the links in the description for all the sources and projects we discussed today. Until next week, keep exploring. Keep learning and keep using Linux.